Hello, blessed be. This is Wicca on Witchcraft 101. I'm High Priestess Tehila Firewind from the Covenant of Open Mind. I know there's been a bit of delay between the last video and this one. I'm very sorry, everyone. Um, we just moved into this beautiful new coven set that you can kind of see behind me. Uh, it's located in Brookha Brookhaven, Pennsylvania. We will have events that are open to the public, and I'm experiencing some technical issues with our website, um, but once I can upload things to our website again, I will upload a calendar that has any upcoming dates on it, uh, and I'll share that information on our Tumblr and our Reddit and anywhere that people might be following us. <clears throat> okay, so this week um, we're deviating away from the more witchcraft side of things, and the very first week I kind of define the difference between Wicca and witchcraft, Wicca being the religion and witchcraft being a tool that people use in multiple different paths. Wicca is like a specific path. Um, so the next portion of this will cover um, ritual construction. Um, if you get through this entire lecture and you do all the homework here, um, then you'll be qualified in ritual construction. Uh, a lot of the reading this time around is very heavily Wiccan. Um, this is a course on Wicca and Witchcraft 101. I may do courses on other things like necromancy. If you're interested in being my student on another path, uh, I'm definitely still qualified to teach in a bunch of different things. So just reach out to me and we can talk separately. So far, everyone interested has been interested in Wicca. So we are going to get very Wicca specific in this lecture and the one following this. So I'm assuming kind of right now that everyone watching this is at least interested in pursuing or understanding what the Wiccan path is like. Um, okay, let's get started. Okay, as a reminder, so we talked in lecture five about evocation. That's been a few weeks back for me now. So evocation is generating energy and putting it into the outside world. It doesn't always mean generating the energy. It could mean taking energy from another person or another thing and then using that energy in some way. Invocation means bringing energy in from an outside source and the purpose is to make some kind of transformation in yourself. Um, it might be so that you can align your thoughts and desires. Um, you want to improve the ease with which you make good choices, uh, the ease with which you cast spells. Um, you want to basically permanently alter yourself so that you can become more effective in your daily life. Um, ritual is usually done at set intervals. It's kind of like a therapeutic thing. You can think about it like, like therapy almost, where your therapist is divinity itself and not some other person. Um, circle should always be used when you're doing any kind of invocations. Um, just like we talked about in the last lecture, a lot of things can cause a lot of negative effects on you if they get in. Um, and so if you don't intend to have any of these things come inside of you and, and change you in some way, then you have to keep them out. And the circle uh, creates that sacred space where you can bring energy in and, and making sure it's cleansed first from higher planes. I mean, as long as you're not like drawing blood in ritual um, or chanting anything that you don't understand, <laughs> you're not going to really be at risk too much. I mean, uh, ritual... It, you know, with the purpose of improving oneself is something that is very hard to have problems with. Um, it, you know, I, I watched the show The Magicians and, and I liked I liked it up until the very end because, um, you know, in, in real life it's true that deities can be both terrible and, and kind, but which deity shows him or herself or itself to you in ritual is entirely dependent on the intent that you enter into the ritual. And so if your intent is something evil, you want to gain power to hurt someone or gain power over someone, um, then you would have to invoke from evil deities or you'd have to bind some kind of demon or um, spirit or something. If your intent is self-improvement or becoming closer to other people, there's no real risk to doing invocation magic of that sort as long as you're keeping other energy out, energy from other people, from chaos, from 
you know, elsewhere. You don't want anything that you don't know what it is and where it comes from coming into your circle. Um, so invocation is used in rituals of any kind. Invocation is pretty much synonymous with ritual. <laughs> um, I mean, pretty much. I, I can't even think of a time when it's when they're used separately. Um, actually, there might be one, but <laughs> I don't know about it. Okay, so um, when you invoke the elements, we talked about this last time as well. This is a little backwards. So the elements have a consciousness of their own just like chaos does, just like deity does. These are different kind of vibrations of energy. They're not separate from us, but they are not us either. They're both within us and around us. They're um, both defined by us and d the definition of us. And it's this kind of weird dichotomy that is bothersome to humans, but isn't really all that bothersome to higher dimensional things, uh, like particles and all that kind of stuff. I, I don't want to get into too much metaphysics here because it scares people away. Um, but this idea of kind of superposition is something that is found in science. It's something that's found in Kabbalah, in pretty much every form of Eastern or of shamanism, Eastern, Western, uh, Native American. There's some idea that everything is one on some level and everything has um, a, a spirit that is, you know, tr both transcendent and personal. Um, so with the elements, the consciousness is something that's very different than consciousness when we're talking about us. We're not talking about I'm awake and I'm thinking these things, these thoughts are coming into my head and I'm aware of them. Okay, that's the that's consciousness, that's the awareness of thoughts. Then when we say the subconscious, we mean the thoughts that you're not aware of, okay, but they're happening inside your mind. And then the unconscious thoughts are things that are not actually happening in your mind, but they may have happened in the past, or you're prone to having them uh, come out of nowhere, um, so stuff like that. So it's, and we draw these arbitrary lines here in, in consciousness, but we don't really fully understand consciousness scientifically. So um, consciousness, you know, in the Kabbalistic model, which is very heavily influenced Wicca um, is basically saying that it emanates down from one place where all the energy is and everything is and there's that's it and you can't get more specific than that or else you're already on a lower plane. <laughs> um, the elemental energy would be like super close to us in this grand scheme of things. It's like the energy of the forces of nature as we talked about and it has consciousness kind of all of its own and anybody who's like been in a traumatic um, catastrophe will tell you how it feels like nature herself is coming for you when a tornado misses that house and misses that house and hits yours and all of your stuff is gone and your whole life is gone and everything seems like it's all over and that sensation is something that, you know, comes because we do kind of perceive of this consciousness somewhere deep down inside of us, but it's a very different kind of consciousness than the one that we have. And, and, and so the elemental energy that is conscious that you feel when, you know, the wind is blowing and the, and the thunder is loud and the lightning lights up the night sky, that, that consciousness that you feel when that's going on um, kind of prevents you from just using that energy and causing tornadoes and hurricanes and you know gross acts of nature like that kind of stuff would be very difficult for a human to do if a human could do it at all and to be honest I don't even know where I stand on it because the amount of energy that a person would have to generate to do that even if it were possible is so high that it seems to me to be basically impossible um, but that's why you would have to bind um, a fairy right you'd have to appeal to the consciousness of the elements themselves and then they would have to do the work for you so you can't just snap your fingers in a tornado forms you'd have to um, you know alter 
particles ever so slightly so that the wind blows a particular way so that several hours later you have a supercell and there's tornadoes everywhere, right? So that kind of um, process is something that is kind of beyond human control in a way, and that's what we mean when we say that the elements have a consciousness of their own, is that they're beyond humanity, you know? So if you're trying to do that kind of thing, that's evocation magic that requires binding um, a fate. But if you're trying to bring out the qualities of yourself that are at the elements, that's different. So you want to pull on the ele the qualities of yourself that are stability and, um, you know, uh, prosperity and abundance. The, the part of you that is, I'm going to focus on this. I can get this done. This is me and I'm confident in what I'm doing and it's going to all be good. Okay, that sensation, that is earth elemental from within you. And um, in order to bring out those traits, you actually have to invoke elemental energy. So it seems backwards because in order to evoke the qualities you'd like in your daily life, you have to do ritual where you bring the elements as conscious beings into yourself, invite them in. And you're not necessarily you're not binding them okay so so most Wiccans don't even believe in binding fairies I mean it's incredibly rude to bind some someone or something without permission um, unless you're doing like something simple like tarot card readings and you just need a bit of their energy so you could do the reading like well, people don't care about that but if you're like binding someone so that you can use their energy or command them or do some kind of gross magical feat people don't really like that so usually you need like permission from them and the same goes for fairies and otherwise so if you um if you want to work with their energy in a more subtle way, a more natural way, and I know this is all natural, none of this is like supernatural, but it, it does, one way does feel more natural, it feels more in tune, it feels like I will become the person who can affect change in my life uh, without needing the kind of power that comes from destroying homes or flooding villages, <laughs> okay? So um, I'll, I'll create the strength within myself the passion, the uh, the mysticism. I'll I'll find the qualities within myself that allow me to be successful. That's kind of the attitude here when you're invoking the elements versus evoking them. So invoking the elements is a part of every ritual. You start off every ritual by inviting them in. You know, you say, "Let their energy come into me." I hope that they'll provide strength to my workings and then once the elements are there in your ritual then you can you know feel stronger feel more like someone who can generate those kinds of energy and then you generate the energy so why do the elements come why do the fey attend your ritual they like the energy that you generate too it's a give and take relationship right so it's no, it's more natural in that it's give and take push and pull which is very much like you know the tides and all the things in nature Okay, so invoking deity, the purpose of this is to broaden one's perspective. So deity is not, so elemental consciousness is on our plane of existence, okay, technically, but they're not embodied. We as humans are embodied, so that's the difference. But the consciousness is all like here, okay, it defines or in some way defines our plane of existence, whether it defines how things change or how things work. Um, if there were no changes. Okay, that's the difference between like elementals and humans. Humans have the free will. Elementals are the scenery. <laughs> They're the, the ambience. Deity is on a higher plane of existence. Sexually, several planes of existence. Depending on which deity you worship, it's on different planes. And it's not like a hierarchy in like the classic sense where like, you know, the person on top has the most power. It's a hierarchy in like, the one on top defines the ones beneath it. So if the one on top didn't exist, then the ones beneath it wouldn't exist either. And deity is like archetypes of the way people are, the way that nature happens, the way that things seem to fall together as if laid out by some intelligent being that is has more perspective than our own. It's primitive science is really what it is. Primitive, primitive science is, you know, understanding the elements and, um, and, and the nature of chaos and that kind of stuff. And primitive, so, and the primitive sociology and psychology would be like understanding deity, understanding consciousness when it's more eminent, when it transcends the human perceptual experience. Um, some people liken it to like 
the matrix, like there is no spoon, you know. So um, deity would be like the awareness that's outside of time and outside of reality, different planes. One plane is outside of time. The next one is outside of reality. The next plane is outside of everything. It is. It just is. That's it. Um, and so there's different deities, and we talked about how they're all like a prism. So these things are all, you know, it's all one thing that kind of becomes more and more confined into these different archetypes, these different patterns. Um, and they represent different modes of thought, different aspects of an event in nature, and uh, echoes of human experience, things that everybody experiences throughout all of history. Um, often it's biological, as we'll see right here. The first archetype, one of the most common, is the Lord and Lady archetype. You have this theme of polarity based around biology. So you have men and they have testosterone and that makes them one way. And then you have women and they have estrogen and that makes them this other way. And they knew, you know, they noticed this from a young age. And in the initial um, stages of religion, it was very balanced. Um, the men would be the hunters and gatherers and they were farmers and they did all of the big heavy moving things, all of the big chores. Um, they did all of, like the burial like um, work, you know, they did a lot of work and they were very respected for it. Um, but women were primarily in charge of the um, religious rituals and birthing rituals and naming days and educated, educating the next generation of magical practitioners. And the reason for that is simply because Estrogen makes people more receptive and testosterone makes people more aggressive. And that's not like everyone who's a man is aggressive because they have testosterone, obviously not. But they did notice correctly that certain hormones have certain effects and exist in different amounts in different people. And they divided it to masculine and feminine for no other reason than because there are two sexes and most people are one or the other. And it was that simple. like. There's just no complication for, well, how do you identify? How are you supposed to act? It was all just, you know, men are hunters and women are spiritual leaders and they take care of the next generation of children. It was biology. Today, it's, we don't, we don't need the advantage of strength to hunt. We need the advantage of intellect. And today, we don't need the advantage of, um, you know, extreme empathy to be a good parent. We need um, just the ability to um, balance kindness and judgment and to be understanding and accepting. And if you notice, all the qualities I just listed fall right in the middle here. These are defined by the qualities of God, the sephirot, the, the, the um, tree of life stuff. There are these different um, qualities. There's chesed, is kindness, and Gavura is judgment. And then when they come together, you have Tiferet, which is heart. That's love. That's, you know. So you have these, and then you have the higher reasoning ones. You have Bina, Dat, and Chochmah. And these represent our ability to uh, experience the world as it is. Um, perceive of the world as we'd like to. And uh, know the truth of the world uh, as if we didn't exist at all and um, this is this is really um, the foundation kind of of the of the awakening movement the kind of renaissance that we're experiencing is that the difference between the sexes is less important and so people are running into this gender identity crisis in today's day and age and you know if we really just to take a step back and, and appreciate that the polarities of masculine and feminine are not um, a true dichotomy, but rather found within each other. That in the great, greater scheme of things, they're lower down on this plane of existence chart than the higher levels. Uh, we'll realize that masculine and femininity are actually one, and they come from the same place, and they're just a polarity, just an opposite uh, feeling. And so I, for instance, have the masculine polarity. I'm a very masculine person. I have an air element. 
um, probably fire would be my second element. Um, my fir first element is spirit, which is the genderless blob in the middle here. Um, but I, I'm really not a creative person. <laughs> I'm, I'm very aggressive. Uh, I tend to kill everything that I touch, like plants and break things. <laughs> and I am. I'm very self-expressive. I love talking. I love teaching. That's why I do these lectures. Um, and and that's great. And that's me. And I'm I'm a very masculine person. But I'm still I'm still a woman. That's how I feel anyway. But some people might feel differently, and that's okay. But in Wicca, we don't mean like actual gender with these. Um, polarities. We're just talking about literally the force that is aggression and the force that is the opposite of aggression, that is receptivity and, and nurturing. Uh, creation versus destruction. Um, on higher planes of existence, you know, souls are genderless. Many, many people say this. You can reincarnate as a man or a woman. Wicca believes that. Lots of other cultures believe that. Um, so it's, you know, it's very common archetype here um, that has affected the way people view and define themselves for a long time, I think it's important to take a step back and realize that your religion shouldn't define you, but you should define your religion <laughs> um, so that it makes you feel comfortable. And, uh, and that's an important thing to remember, but we can't just throw out <laughs> this archetype because you know, society is not a big fan of the dichotomy here because there is a very real reason to consider that this polarity is real and affects us to this day. There's a reason why so many cultures come to have two genders. Now there are cultures that have more than two genders, so it's not purely a biological. It's most, gender is mostly a sociological thing, but that's like a whole separate lecture. <laughs> um, but so this is this is widespread. You find it in Celtic, Gaelic, Germanic, Greco-Roman, so the Western world, but you don't necessarily find this lord and lady archetype in other uh, cultures. You don't find it like the way it is here, like it's some kind of, um, like you can't have a lord without a lady kind of deal. Like in other cultures, um, there are goddesses and gods, but they're less important that they're paired up together, I guess. Um, the tri-deity, however, is found in pretty much every culture all over the world. I've never found a single culture that didn't have some reference to it. Um, the tri-deity is where you take three related concepts and you put it together. And the relation is always some, con some derivative of cardinal, fixed, mutable. Cardinal is creation, generating energy, the start of something new, invention, Fixed is sustaining energy, um, it's uh, uh, strength and boldness and, um, and a feeling of, of completion, a feeling of climax. And then you have mutable energy that's waning energy, that's um, kind of like the dying, the, the becoming more wise with age energy and eventually ceasing to exist or, or being reborn. It's like the moon phases. Literally, this stuff is all based off of the moon because back in the day, when there wasn't any technology and people didn't know anything about literally anything, like the moon moving through the sky and the sun rising and setting every day was like fucking incredible. <laughs> and they just loved that. <laughs> and so they, they really, all of these systems of religion are kind of based around, on some fundamental level, our physical surrounding. It'd be so interesting to watch people grow up on another planet and yeah. see what kind of religion they come up with if their existence is so different than ours. But uh, on Earth, this is this is a really common thing, and, and that's why, because the human experience, the Earth-based human experience is something that's very constant be between all of us, really, and people just don't consider how much we have in common. But I gave a lot of examples here. Um, but you don't have to go through them all. I just want to draw attention to what these different kinds are. So you have the mother-father version. There's one of these in like literally every culture. Even the moon trinity here for the Greek, that's also a mother trinity. The Morrigan, also a mother trinity. Um, so there's the idea of maiden, mother, crone, right? So maiden, it's, of course, it's all based on like how attractive women are to men, but we can reclaim these terms, women, okay? Maiden just means young woman, someone who is up and coming, just figuring out what their 
purpose in life is and where they fit in and exploring new paths. And then you have the mother, that's someone who's giving back and they're starting to teach and they're giving more of themselves. And then you have the crone and the crone would be, you know, old and, and wise and teaching less, but giving very good advice when, when you give it and um, kind of like achieving that difference in perspective that allows them to uh, walk into death with open arms. If you see, it aligns with the priestess, high priestess, and elder high priestess of Wicca. So I'm, you know, in the mother stage now. I took on the role of taking care of other people and having students and being a teacher. And so now I'm transitioning into the mother uh, role. And, and, and I do feel like a, a difference like that in that way. So, of course, because like I said in the beginning, the, the women were the primary um, uh, baby makers and they took care of the babies and they led all the religious rituals. So that's why they have maiden mother crone because that's, you know, the crone is the wise old sage, the wise old woman who knows just about everything about just about everything. Um, so for men, you know, just as sexist in the other way, <laughs> the, the man was the warrior, uh, then they were the father, and, and at that point they're responsible for like building the house. <laughs> so it's still like ridiculously physical things, and uh, it's, a, it's a very hard life really in, in that sense. Uh, and then when they're old and they're too old to do anything or be useful, they're the sage, right? So they sit around not saying much and just having thoughts and visions and 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 that's it and so um so that's like the traditional uh way of thinking about these things but you know and it's you know a little sexist but it, it's it's traditional and that's that's what you're gonna get when you come when you talk about traditional things <laughs> um but you wind up seeing in there the theme of cardinal fixed and mutable which is really the energy that you're trying to capture because that is that is the important thing it's what mimics the moon phase um now we also have some triads here that don't fit into the cardinal fixed mutable so the creation triad um, poseidon zeus and hades that represents actually creation itself so first there was the sea then there was the sky and then there was the other world, right? Germanic has one too, where they have Odin, he gives the soul and life to humanity, Vili gives the intellect, and Ve gives the personality. So you have these three people that are technically one person, but apparently creating people was so hard for that, they needed three different things to en encapsulate it. So what you can see here really is just, you know, like I said, prehistoric, um, <laughs> um, science like you know just them trying to figure out how things work and, and understand the human condition and why we're here and what we're meant to do here you have the death triad in, in the egyptian death triad where you have dying death and rebirth that was extremely important in egypt the whole idea of dying death and rebirth so the Adip the egyptian death triad is now there is an egyptian death triad for women as well um in in egypt the uh, many times the women were not really goddesses in a sense um there was less of a polarity idea in egypt it's it's kind of not like um other uh well-known um pantheons in the e in the egyptian pantheon the women were often basically like keys they were like the way that um, humanity can receive divine energy, right? So it's still the polarity of receptivity and um, and, aggress and aggression, but the the and and you get the duality of women and men there in that culture as well. So I, I probably should have listed Egyptian on the previous slide, but um, but it's less important. The the most of the important relationships in the Egyptian pantheon are are like. Um, uh, I have pictured here, and and there's there's others like similar ones like Ra and, and Toad are are probably in a triad with someone. I can't think of who else. Would. But you have you have these things where there's like the chariot of the god, and then there's the sun that rides in the chariot, and then there's the woman that allows you to uh, be aware of the sun, and the woman that allows you to be aware of the chariot, and it's just like this really complicated um, system of deities that represents the way to do magic because pretty much everything in ancient Egypt was focused around doing magic as opposed to 
really being a very pious or divinity laden uh, culture, you you get more of the sense of of divine worship from other regions more so than Egypt. Um, you know, Egypt had the had the gall to compare their pharaohs to divine beings, for instance. So that's proof in and of itself of how much Egypt really valued evocation magic. You know, so so then you have the primordial teachers um, in Egypt. You have Tot. Imhotep is another one. Tot is the uh, god of magic and judgment. So before Tot, there was no magic. Then Tot discovered magic. He also created judgment. He created the idea of government, of law. So you could say that there really was no concept of deity before Tot. Because even though there were divine beings, they had no power over anyone. <laughs> so it's, it's very interesting. Um, you also have from the Gaulish region, Aradia. So it's like French and uh, North Irish. Um, Aradia is the first witch. She's called Diana's Queen. The idea is that this woman was very divine and very good with magic. And Diana got mad at the Roman Church and decided to initiate her as a, wit as a witch. And she would take revenge against Christianity. We'll see a little more about that further in this presentation. In Greece, you have Demeter. Um, she is the goddess of initiation, so through her you can gain high awareness. And uh, in Sumeria, there's Enki. And Enki is interesting because he really represents the ability of man <clears throat> to become divine. So Enki is kind of, he's the god of crafts, learning, and creation. And in the old epoch, he's kind of always been divine. But in the new phase, he took on a new name, Marduk. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that um, at some point, um, a man was so much of a hero that he transcended this plane and and came to know Enki and formed a new god, Marduk. Uh, it's very complicated talking about these different pantheons because we have to understand is that the differences um, you know between an older time and a newer time in these different religions come about because people are moving around, their languages are evolving, their culture is evolving, um, and the gods represent really the way they think about the world, the way they perceive everything around them. So as that perception changes, so do the names and, and roles of the different deities. And that's why it's so hard to, to hone in on some of the purposes of some of these older beings is because the civilizations had lasted for so long. Um, that they took on many different meanings all over the place. And so it's always a challenge to look back and some of the older um, fates in that way. But it all comes down to the same romantic notion of how the gods gave us fire, and that's why we're better than animals, whatever. So another archetype is the horned god. This one is very big in Wicca. So I put a lot of pictures here. Both of the pictures here on the left are Sir Nunos. Um, Sir Nunos is Celtic. Um, he would have basically been um, in the region of France and probably northern Spain and northern Italy um, and maybe a little bit of um, western Germany until Rome came along and kind of stole his idea and pushed most of the Celts out. Um, the Celts all then left and settled uh, primarily in southern Ireland and southern Britain, um, pushing the Gales further north who were already there. And um, any of the Celts that stayed behind were basically absorbed, killed or absorbed into the Roman Empire. So you have this like Frankish transition stage in this region called Gaul. Um, and Gaul is kind of like a hodgepodge of um, different ancestries. Like if you're from Gaul, then you're pretty much like a little bit of everything in the world. <laughs> um, and that's Northern Italy, France, Northern Spain, um, and probably Western Germany a bit. And it's a hodgepodge of Celts and Germanics and Hel Hellenics, that's Greek, and Italics, that's Roman. Those are the linguistic tree names. So you get this theme that kind of has 
been throughout the ages. It started with Sir Nunos, and Sir Nunos was a horned god who had antlers, and he was often depicted as being um, basically a deer on two legs with human arms and a human chest, sometimes with a human face, sometimes with a deer face. Um, the idea was as above, so below. So we want to hunt the deer and have food, so we will put on a deer head and dance around the fire and scare everyone and make merry and have a good time and then hopefully when we do our hunt the gods will honor us and we will catch the deer so that we can continue to live. So Sir Nunos is like the oldest magic trick in the book, <laughs> basically, as above, so below. I will mimic what I want so that it's easier for me to be receptive to what I want and it comes more to me. Um, when the uh, Greco-Roman region started expanding, um, Pan and Faunus, um, Faunus is the Roman, Pan is the Greek, um, came about. They're a god of fertility, music, and nature, so exactly the same concept as Sir Nunos, but now um, they kind of made him seem like he was super sexual. So the original Sir Nunos was seen always with his legs crossed. He was very... Um, ascendant, transcendent, um, and, and he was someone to, to really look up to and be revered. And then when you get to the Greek and Roman era, because the, the real um, sexual urges and the sexual, um, like, erismancy and, and sex magic and all of that stuff, it was really founded in, in Greek and Roman regions. They turned Pan into a very sexual god who is always trying to hump someone and he always has an erection and, you know, so it's a similar concept, but it's a totally different take on it because the Celts were like much more austere. And actually, if you like spend any time learning Celtic, Irish, um, you'll understand it's very, um, it's just very traditional and classy and, and high class, I guess I would say. Um, whereas, you know, the people who stuck around and formed Pan, they they spoke vulgar Latin and, and Frankish, which was a derivative of Germanic. And it was basically just like slang, and that's what forms formed the French language. <laughs> and... Um, well, most of it, a lot of it is still just basically Latin. Um, but so they kind of were like the lower class and, and they turned Pan into this really super sexual kind of being because that really encapsulated how they felt about fertility and music and drinking and, and that's who Pan became. Then um, Pan was demonized by the Christian church. Um, and a movement, uh, the Knights Templar was the first recorded who worshipped Baphomet, spelled originally with an F, not a PH. Um, Baphomet was supposedly the devil, and he, and many believe that he is just Pan um, with a different face, uh, you know, but he looks and seems totally different. So Baphomet is pictured right here, and he's Gaulish, right? So he came about in like 1600s um, France and northern Italy, which was the region of Gaul. Um, so he is a truly uh, hodgepodge, and you can see what I mean when I'm talking about a hodgepodge region. Like, look at how they threw this guy together. He has so many things going on in this picture that it's insane. He has vulgar Latin on one arm. He's got all these tattoos. Uh, he's got the erection that you would expect from Pan, but it doesn't look the same. It has uh, snakes going around it. Um, and then he has, you know, one hand pointing at the light moon and one hand pointing at the dark moon, and that's meant to represent balance. So it's like this whole new concept that instead of it's just like the god of fertility, is more like a genderless being of uh, of balance, of of sex, uh, um, you know, from both sides of uh, light and dark, of more than just the sexual um, being that Pan was. So he really is a kind of a whole separate person, Baphomet, and um, there's a lot of liturgy toward Baphomet in Chaos Magic. Um, it is my understanding that Baphomet is a demon, is actually the 
uh, head of the demon pantheon, where demons are, the consciousness of chaos. So in that way, Baphomet would be the equivalent of Satan, because um, Satan would be the lord of chaos, basically. Um, for a long time, I thought it was the lord of shadows, and it's not, and I'll tell you why. So the lord of shadows is basically death, and all of the life sourced gods, like Sir Nuno's, have death counterparts, like the Dagda. So they have a life and a death counterpart. You have the Morrigan. She's the death um, goddess. You know, so there's death goddesses and life goddesses, and all of them are very similar, and they all experience the same archetypes. When people die, they get reborn. Nobody is suffering. There's no real concept of hell. It doesn't make any sense that the Lord of Shadows... Um, you know, and they call the, they call the Lord of Shadows in, in Germanic culture, they call her Hell. But if you notice, Hell is never making anybody suffer. Hell is both a place and a person, and she just houses the underworld, right? So she's an underworld deity, that's an archetype. Um, her father, Loki, he's the one who causes all of the fighting, all of the suffering, all of the problems for all of these people. Loki would be the equivalent of Satan in that pantheon, the Lord of Chaos, right? So you do see that theme throughout history, and it's a very fine distinction. Um, I feel like I need to write a blog post on it, because not a lot of people really talk about this in the pagan community. Um, I also feel like I'm getting a little off topic, so I'll come back to that in a future lecture, hopefully, that I do just on Davies. There's so many archetypes. I have them, uh, a bunch of them listed here. There's agricultural ones. Um, so, for instance, Lu, Lu as in Luke Nasa. That is this, the harvest where, you know, Lu is, sacrifices himself to us so that he's in the wheat and he sacrifices himself so that we can have bread all winter long. There's animal gods. Um, you know, Bast is actually a cat. <laughs> like, she's literally a cat. Um, then you have seasonal, like, um, Bridget. She represents the dawn or Dellinger. Um, Bridget is Celtic, Dellinger is Germanic, and he represents the dawn as well. So one gave dawn to man and the other gave dawn to, to woman. See how different cultures throughout history have assigned different gender roles to their forces of nature based on how they perceive the polarity in nature. So that's another reason to believe that it's very sociological, all of this. Then there's creator ones we talked about a bit, birth, literally goddesses of giving birth, of motherhood, of fertility we talked about, arts and crafts, domestic and hearth gods, people would have gods specific to their own house even, um, there's gods of commerce and war, so Ares and Mars are both gods of war, Athena is a goddess of war. Um, then you have destroyer, uh, death, and underworld gods. So those are all different tropes, you know. And then you have the savior, and the savior is like hunter and savior are like really aggressive kind of people. You have um, Artemis is a hunter. Um, you have Hercules is a savior or like a hero. That's that archetype. Um, you have Hades and Hell who are functionally the same. Then you have gods of the earth and sky and weather and solar and lunar and all of those you hear about all the time. You have rain gods and fire gods and Jupiter is a sky god, Poseidon is a ocean god. You have the messenger gods like Hermes and uh, Mercury and then you have um, Heimdall, I believe is his name, who is watching the bridge to, um, to uh, what is it called? Well, where the Aesir live. Um, and then you have gods of magic like Tote and Imhotep. Um, let's see, gods of magic in other cultures. There are, I can't think of them off the top of my head. I know there's a bunch. Trickster gods we talked about. Um, so Baphomet would technically be a trickster god, I think. Um, but he could also fall under like... Um, no, nah, there's no other really good category for him. So I'd say trickster possibly wisdom it could be a wisdom god um another wisdom god or goddess would be hecate or caridwen they're both wisdom goddesses crown goddesses 
Um, tutelary, I had to look up the definition of this one. Um, this one would be like familiars, like if you believe in animism and like it, all animals have souls and one of the animals is a part of you and but is also from the divine plane, that would technically be tutelary. Um, and guardians, like, like the saints um, who are worshipped like deities would be tutelary deities, really, by definition. Um, which is why I think Catholicism and Christianity generally are very much like paganism. <laughs> um, and then you have gods of love, lust, virgin, vengeance, etc. Many people are familiar with those. So that's all I really want to talk about for gods this time. I'm going to go more in depth in the next lecture about how to find your own patron if you want that um, or why you might not want that. I'll talk about all of that next week. For now, this is just like an overview of deity as it pertains to ritual construction, which is really the focus of this video. I know it's crazy, it took me 45 minutes to get to the focus, but here we are. <laughs> when you're doing ritual, everything kind of follows a set pattern. First, you prepare the space. You sweep. You might spiritually sweep if you're indoors. Some people do the step later. That's why there's a star. You set up your altar. Only consecrated things go on the altar. Everything else that you need for circle, you bring inside the circle because you can't go out the circle once you cast it or it loses energy and it might pop. You might have to recast it. So you bring everything in, but if it's not consecrated and it's not meant for ritual use, it's just like to support the ritual, like lighters and extra candles and drums, whatever you need to bring in. Those usually don't go on the altar. They go underneath it or near it. Uh, and then you would construct the circle if you want a visual. So maybe you'll hang ribbons or you'll put like rocks in the ground or some people have like gigantic rocks in the ground that take them years to put up. <laughs> so whatever you want to use. Second step is to prepare yourself. So you take a ritual bath. If you're public or you're out in a park and there's no way for you to like dip into a river or something, you can like have a bowl of water that people take and like rub on certain parts of themselves to like simulate being clean like I don't like it that much I prefer the bath way but if you have a lot of people and it's a public ritual the other way is easier um, you'll don ritual attire um, it should only be worn in ritual you can also do ritual naked I had to read that chapter about sky clad before you're going to read about it a little bit more this time Frank come on Frank come on my dog is just really excited to learn how to do ritual apparently <laughs> um, so you will want to, um, you can don a tire that is entirely visualized as well. Some people will imagine getting out of a box and opening it and putting on a ring and throwing a cloak over themselves and tying it, whatever you want to do. Um, people will do that especially if they're out in public somewhere and they didn't get the chance to um, bring the ritual stuff with them, but they want to feel like they're in ritual still. Then you smudge yourself with incense. Smudge doesn't mean like touching yourself. I thought it did at first. <laughs> it just means like wafting the smoke around you and like getting it around you. It's like smudging doesn't actually mean like smudging something like you would expect. <laughs> um, then you purify yourself with consecrated salt water. So you consecrate the salt, consecrate the water, add the salt to the water, consecrate yourself. Then you would anoint yourself with oil. All of this before you even go into circle. Now after you do the ritual bath, before you get to circle, like you're in the zone now. You're not talking. You're not joking. You're not. You're just paying attention, and and you're ready to do ritual, and you're in the right frame of mind. Next is consecrate the space. So um, this might mean just like doing a bit of sage. Some people would sweep here uh, again. Usually only if you're inside. Some people might say blessings or prayers, asking for it to be cleansed as well. That's very common. Next, you get everyone together you know, who's in the ritual. If you're by yourself, that's fine. If you're with people, organize this because it works better that way. Get everyone to meditate together with a guided meditation or something or hum or do an om, you know, om, whatever. Get people to sing some kind of song that's simple that helps them get in the right mindset to do a ritual. You might have people do yoga. You might have people do breathing exercises, whatever. Once everyone's on the same page, in the right mood, ready to go, um, now, before they even get here, before you even do the ritual bath or anything, everyone is already knows what the ritual is. You you have told people the ritual in advance, right? That's the idea. <laughs> um, so by the time you get here, everyone's ready to just be a part of the ritual. So next you cast circle. Trace the circle thrice about to keep evil spirits out. So you might do different things, and I talked in the past about how you can cast circle, and there's lots of different ways to do it, so I won't go over it again here. Then you invite or commune with the elements. 
or invoke them, depending on what makes you feel more comfortable. Are you just going to say, you know, Watchtower of the West, please watch over this right? Or are you going to say, I command the energy of fire that you come forth into this circle and provide your strength and guidance to us? You know, something like that would be more of an invocation. Uh, you invite deity to attend, or you invoke deity. You can invite deity to attend now and invoke deity later, or you can invoke deity now. The idea is that you're bringing this energy into circle, into yourself, and through yourself into circle, so that you have all of this energy here, and everyone in the circle is sharing the same energy and, and generating the same energy so that you have so much energy to work with, and then the high priestess or whoever's in charge will just direct that energy or do something with that energy in accordance with the purpose of the ritual. And so, step six, did I skip five now? Okay. Step six, you're going to state the, pur the purpose of the ritual. You know, so the purpose of this rite be to bring us closer to our mother goddess, blessed be. You know, something, okay. The purpose of this rite be to initiate this new member into our lineage. Okay, something like that. Uh, for spell work, this is optional. You may or may not want to do spell work. A lot of times the spell work is like, um, bring me prosperity, which is actually an invocation. You're invoking the element of earth so that you can wield it in your daily life. Okay, so that's not really spell work at all, technically. <laughs> um, but a lot of times you might do spell work for an external thing and generate the energy in circle, and then you'll just kind of like let it sit there until you're ready to let it all go. Um, oftentimes the spell work will be to generate an energy from everyone that you want to wield within the circle for the purpose of transformation. So everyone does the energy and then I bind the energy technically, but I'm not really binding it because everyone's in the circle with me. So it's like binding, but different, you know, it's, it's basically like the most zeroth form of binding where I'm working with other people's energy, but because we're all here and we're all together and our energy is now one and the same and I'm just directing it. You know, that would be like what the high priestess is doing and that's like often the purpose of the spell work that's done within ritual specifically. Obviously spell work can still be done at any time with or without the whole circle and invocation thing. Most of the time you're doing spell work, you're not invoking things. But when you do spell work as a part of ritual, you're doing it for the purpose of invocations later on usually. Then you raise what's called the cone of power. Most people visualize it as an actual cone that like forms above them that they then just point in some direction or another. Um, you raise the power by dancing, chanting, singing, humming, drumming, whatever takes you to another place, whatever makes you tick, you do that. Um, people will hold hands and go in a circle. They'll do all kinds of things. Um, you generate the energy to power the spell and then the high priestess would either direct this energy or invoke it depending what you're doing. Again, so a lot of different examples I can think of here. The next step would be the Great Rite. Um, this is a very traditional Wiccan step. So if you're doing a less Wiccan ritual, you would probably skip this or replace it with something else. It's also called Cakes and Ale. Um, you have a lot of great energy swirling around, and two people who are priest level or higher needs to be, like, you have to be an initiated witch to really have the ability to do this. I'd say, I mean, you don't have to be initiated by someone, but you have to feel like you're priest or priestess level. Um, but it's good to do it even just for practice at a lower level, though it might you might not get the same effects um, if you're less practiced with the magic. But um, the idea is to consecrate the food and wine offerings. This is a phallic and sensual practice. Um, it's where you take the athame and you put it in the chalice and to represent masculine into feminine and then feminine blesses the food. Right? So then you offer the food and drink to everyone. It goes around and you say, may you never thirst, may you never hunger. Everyone goes around until it's basically all gone, until there's a little bit left, then they might pour it on the ground or leave it on the altar for the spirits. Um, and then the energy from the spell might be used here, uh, or at this time you might release it externally. The Great Rite is the climax of the ritual. It's literally the climax, you know, and it represents a climax. Get it? So <laughs> that's the idea. Now, there's nothing inherently arousing about this. Even if people are naked and they're doing this ritual, they might experience, like, uh, kind of like 
a very subtle sense of sexual attraction and they should because that is the energy you're trying to get but it doesn't it's it's not arousing it's very odd it doesn't really make sense it's not we're not doing orgies here i mean some people might and they're more than welcome to but most wiccans aren't about that and they're they're feeling that sexual energy but they're not allowing it to affect them and that is the difference between um, sex magic and the great right in terms of Wicca is that it's not really sex magic. It generates sexual energy, um, but it doesn't really use that to evoke anything. It's more just um, it's it's more just so that they have more power over the other energy that's already been created, that's already in the circle around them. So the last step in the ritual is to resolve it. Um, you can basically do these steps in any order. You can close the circle and or ground and center before or after you close the circle. It doesn't particularly matter. You do have to ground and center. That is very important. Um, you know, there's many ways to ground and center. Certain drugs are good for grounding. Certain drugs are better for ritual. Uh, for instance, it's not usually very helpful to go into ritual stoned, but smoking after ritual can really help people come down and, and and dampen their perspective, but it depends on the person. For some people, it might be the exact opposite effect. Um, so, you know, that is something that you can consider. There's also meditation techniques and dance moves and certain kinds of music and playing drums. There's a lot of things that people can do to ground and center. Sometimes it means just sitting down and having something to eat and having a regular conversation with something about something that has nothing to do with divinity. <laughs> um, you know, if that's your idea of grounding and centering, maybe you want to do that after you close circle. Maybe you don't feel the need to close circle at all. Um, some people, most people, will go around and take the circle down the same way it was put up. They'll bid farewell to the deities. They'll bid farewell to the elements. You know, they'll say, thank you to the Watchtower of the East. May you go in peace and forever bless us. So mo to be something. And then we'll do the banishing uh, pentagram. Uh, now, then there's others out there who will say the Athame is not a vacuum cleaner and the circle ends when the great right climaxes and after that you're always grounding and centering and that's just how it works. You know, for instance, that's how Alexandrians feel. So Gardnerians go around and take the circle down and Alexandrians don't. And whichever way you decide, generally, and whichever way you decide you want to do it is totally up to you. Okay, so some advanced things. So advanced ritual construction. Um, rituals, one advanced thing that you can do, I don't want to cover too many advanced ritual construction topics here. So if you finish this course, you probably are first degree worthy ritual construction. Um, I would say that most of the advanced rituals are things like hand fastings and baby blessings and funeral rites and those are the kinds of things that you don't really learn how to do until you're a second degree, until you're high priestess. So um, we're only going to cover the one advanced ritual construction thing that kind of pertains to first degree level and that is rituals to honor specific deities. So most people wind up with a patron or two as a first degree, people that are deities they really like to work with, archetypes that really help bring out the best in themselves and help them become better witches. Um, I say this because leading into next week we're going to talk about patrons and what it means to have a patron and all that good stuff. But for now, just imagine you wanted to do a ritual to honor a specific deity. Maybe it's Nasa and you want to honor Lou. Uh, maybe it's uh, Emyolk and you want to honor Bridget. Um, you know, whatever the case may be. I'll say this, deities are usually very particular. Some deities less than others, okay? But if you're trying to do a Gaia deity ritual and you're inside with shoes on and you're chanting in Latin, it's not going to go so well, okay? But if you're outside and you're barefoot in the grass and you're dancing and, you're, and everything smells like nature and maybe it's raining, maybe it's not, either way, that is more of the kind of ritual that would help you embody Gaia's energy, right? So think about ritual, right? The purpose of ritual is to transform you in some way so that you are a different person after the ritual than you were before. You're inspired, you have more energy than you had, and you can do, you feel like you can do anything. Now, if you're doing ritual for, in certain ways, you might not have more energy, you might have less, but it just depends on what the purpose of the ritual is. If you're doing a ritual for a particular deity, you'll have more energy than you had before you went into it because that's the idea, is that you want to walk away with energy that helps you be a different person in your daily life. 
Um, certain yeah. deities, they say that certain deities will not allow their energy to be invoked by just anyone. Yeah. I don't really like that phrasing yeah. because it's, it kind yeah. of makes humans seem like they have less power yeah. than I feel like they really have over things. Um, you know, it's not yeah. like anyone's commanding. I mean, people do this. They do evoke deity, but it's yeah. not a good idea. It's not like anyone's commanding yeah. deity to do this or that. It's just that, um, some people are not really prepared to handle or they're not even able to perceive of the awareness of certain forces of nature because they're so much greater than their own existence that they're just not able to be aware of it. And this is why most people find that they take on a patron or two in their first degree because they're realizing what this awareness is and what this awareness means in the greater scheme of things and how they relate to the world um, kind of in a sense that is outside of themselves. And that prompts people to take on patrons and to become more connected to divinity. Now, some people will never connect to divinity through, de through deities like, you know, like, you know, aspects of deity. Some people won't even perceive of deity at all, and that's totally fine. You know, however people walk their paths in life is up to them. But in Wicca, that's not really what happens. In Wicca, we relate to deity through these different aspects of deity, through the archetypes of human, you know, psychology, basically. Um, or rather, the parts of human psychology that transcend individual experience. That would be the way to say it. Um, since language reflects subconscious thoughts and sensation affects thought at every level, certain deities require certain types of material offerings or phrasings or colors. Everything should be associated with the deity if you're doing a ritual to a deity. I have an example we're going to step through right now. So this is up on our website, covenantofopenmind.com. If you look under resources, you'll find there's a lot of stuff there. <laughs> I'm still working on um, redoing a few things that could be um, that could look nicer. But um, all the content on there I wrote myself. I had spent countless hours doing research and fact-checking every source there is to check. So I'm fairly sure that everything up there is really accurate. And if you spot anything that you think is wrong, please feel free to reach out to us. I did write all of these rituals. Um, I was writing them for every full moon, so we'd have a bunch of moon rituals up there. And recently I started write, writing them for the Sabbaths instead. Um, this one is an example moon ritual to Tote. So Tote is a male moon god. Uh, he represents magic and receptivity to, uh, a receptivity in the sense of uh, working with the universe to make changes in a very subtle way uh, that, that is you know, pu purely divine and less uh, magic from evocation. Now, he did invent magic from evocation is how the story goes. Um, actually, I feel like I feel like that's really not the case, and there's more to the story, and Imhotep did a lot more of the evocation magic than people give him credit for, but um, that's also a much longer discussion. So for now, just know that Tote is a, is a magic god. He represents, like, subtle magic, and he's very particular. He really likes order. He really likes everything to go in a particular way. Everything has to be just so, and because he's a magic god, you have to do magic if you're invoking him in ritual, like, he'll be mad if you invoke his energy and then you don't do anything with it. Like, he'd be mad. He wouldn't even come to you again, probably. Um, or it would be hard to get him to come again. And you'll just walk away from that ritual feeling like you missed something, like feeling like something is absent, and that's not a pleasant feeling. You should walk away from ritual feeling like you were home and, like, everything works well for you. So when I wrote this ritual, I kept all these things in mind, and I said, you know, there's a very strict way of doing it. You have to say, by earth and water, I consecrate this space. By air and fire, I consecrate this space. By this blade be conjured, O circle of power, I consecrate thee, O circle of power. And then you say, by thrice traverse, the circle is cast. So the reason is that it's very particular, it's very exact, specific wording, and it's not leaving any room for, you know, you're not making any requests, you're not making any demands, you're just saying, this is what's going to happen, and it's going to happen. You know, that's like totes energy. I used a white candle because it's a moon ritual. Um, here you would replace your name if you're not reading it in Egyptian, and I highly recommend you do read it in Egyptian. You would replace it with your name. So the, the idea is that you're invoking him using words from the actual Book of the Dead. Um, that's what this is. I, I got this from the Book of the Dead. Um, and you're saying, you know, homage to the bull of Amentet, behold tote, 
the king of eternity is with me. And then you would draw his symbol. And that is exactly how, you know, priests would have invoked Tod in the past. Te'et an ausar ani, ausar ein ani, anechaka ka amantet, antechuti suten chech ama. Right? So that is, it's very tote like. <laughs> I don't know how to say it. It's very particular. You know, if you didn't say it exactly right, tote would get mad. You know, get mad in, in the sense that he's not a real person. So that's doesn't make any sense but um and then and then you go on to say like things about him like i am the great god in the boat so the idea is that once you draw his symbol now he's within you now he's here he's within you so now the it changes from homage to thee bull of amentet behold tote the king of eternity is with me to i am the great god in the boat i have fought for thee i am one of those gods the divine chiefs who make osiris victorious over his enemies on that day the weighing of the words and i say tot speaking is referring to the day he spoke an existence came to be the idea is that tot listened to ra and spoke an existence came to be so everything that you speak has to be significant in a ritual to tot and so here i have this whole elaborate invocation if you go on the website and you look further down I do like a magical thing, and then I also do a whole honor of tote thing that's again in Egyptian, it's blah blah blah. So then I also, so I have another ritual on the website to the goddess Ninlil, and you'll find in that one you have to speak the Sumerian that's there. She won't even come if you don't. Like, very, very particular, uh, moody, crone deity, very customary to Sumerian mythos. <laughs> so um, then there's some that are much less particular and there's a beginner ritual so if you're really new to this stuff and you're like oh this is all over my head I have a beginner ritual up there as well that doesn't invoke any specific deities at all so you should take a look at that one too another concept that I have to talk about when I'm talking about ritual is drawing down the moon uh, this is different than aspecting I'll talk about that in a minute the idea behind drawing down the moon is that you invoke enough goddess energy or enough if it's not drawing down the moon but drawing down something else you invoke enough deity energy uh, to channel the awareness of that deity and speak as them directly and the purpose is usually for divination or to say blessings or to provide awakenings to the people in the circle to the divinity um, the idea of this came from the original charge of the goddess it was written by charles godfrey leland in his book aradia which is on the um i think i have a copy of it if you need it's probably gonna be in the homework um i'll, I'll put it in the homework even though it's it's optional for you to read it because it's it's really hard to get through in my opinion um but his way of saying this was tis true indeed that thou a spirit art but thou wert born but to become again a mortal thou must go to earth below to be a teacher unto women and men who fain would study witchcraft in thy school yet like cain's daughter thou shalt never be nor like the race who have become at last wicked and infamous from suffering as are the jews blah 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 he goes on and on okay look on and on and i even cut some of it out see the dot 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 he goes on and on like all about christianity and and thou shalt be the first of which is known and thou shalt be the first of all the world and thou shalt and thou shalt teach the art of poisoning of poisoning those who are great lords of all <laughs> okay uh, and then she says and when ye find a peasant who is rich then ye shall teach the witch your pupil how to ruin all his crops with tempests dire so he's basically just being like anarchy anarchy for everyone double the harm and do it in the name of me diana queen of witches all and then he goes on with a bunch of hate speech propaganda that's like a little nuts and then he gets to the part that people have echoed throughout the ages when he says when I, when i shall have departed from this world whenever ye have need of anything once in the month when the moon is full ye shall assemble in some desert place or in a forest all together join to adore the potent spirit of your queen my mother great diana she who fain would learn all sorcery yet has not won its deepest secrets then my mother will teach her in truth all things as yet unknown and ye shall be freed from slavery and so ye shall be free in everything and as the sign that ye are truly free ye shall be naked in your rights both men and women also this shall last until the last of your oppressors shall be dead and ye shall make the game of benevento extinguishing the lights and after that shall hold your supper thus and it goes on okay 
This is a grimoire. <laughs> it is a Gaulish record of how to do magic and practice religion that was written with the purpose of instructing other people. And it came about in the 1800s, so it is kind of Gaulish in origin, but it came about late enough that Gaul is no longer really a region. It's very Gaulish, though, if you know anything about the Gauls. <laughs> So Doreen Valiant, okay, she was the, she's the mother of modern witchcraft. She um, met uh, Gerald Gardner, and Gerald Gardner had written his first couple books that were mostly just, um, the first one was entirely fictional, and then just like papers here and there, just kind of trying to warm up the world, the idea of the occult after the burning times. And um, Doreen Valiant got involved, and she was the real poet. So a lot of the stuff that you'll read from um, Gardner is not always written very well. <laughs> but Doreen Valiant, on the other hand, is a much better writer. Most most people feel that way. I personally really like Gardner's fiction, but most people don't. <laughs> um, but so she rewrote this charge. It says, listen to the words of the great mother who was all of old also called Artemis Astarte Diana. Melusine, Aphrodite, Caridwin, Donna, Arianrud, Isis, Bridid, and many other names. Whenever ye have need of anything once in a month. So she skips all the hate speech. And better it be when the moon be full, then ye shall assemble in some secret place and adore the spirit of me, who am queen of all witcheries. So now she's basically saying that the goddess is the queen of witches, whereas Charles Godfrey Leland is saying that the Aradia was the queen of witches and that the goddess set her up to be the queen of witches. And so when people say, you must have been initiated by a witch, and everyone's like, well, who was the first witch? The answer to that question is technically Aradia was the first witch, um, if you believe that. But of course, we can't believe that because we understand that history is much more dynamic than that and that these uh, are all kind of very different interpretations of very old cultures and all of these authors basically essentially appropriated lots of things <laughs> and it's not that there's anything wrong with appropriation necessarily um, you know if, if it's for the purpose of bringing cultures together and and helping to unite things that ha that people have in common then that can be actually a very beneficial thing but it, it is a fact of nature that cultures fuse together and and change their shape, and this is one example of that. So she goes on and words everything in her own way, and you can feel free to pause this and read this whole thing. Uh, I don't feel the need to reread the whole thing now, but you'll see that she calls her the star goddess. That's after Doreen Valiant came into the coven and started saying that, so did Gerald Gardner, so that was very influential of her. You know, she says, I am the soul of nature who giveth life to the universe, from me all things proceed, and unto me all things must return. And before my face, beloved of gods and mortals, thine inmost divine self shall be unfolded in the rapture of infinite joy. So you can see that she's obviously a very poetic writer. Um, okay, so I'm not as poetic as her, but I also think that all of these charges are a bit outdated. I read the Charles Godfrey Leland version, and I just kind of really loved it for like the good parts and really hated the rest of it. Um, so I went ahead and rewrote it as well. It's in the One Moon Ritual for Beginners. Um, and I'll just go ahead and read mine. It goes, it is true that a spirit thee are, born but to again become mortal. Down to earth below, teach near and far the natural wisdom of the earth to any who would accept the toil. And be not like others who follow, who grovel, who hope, only dreaming, helplessly floating along, hollow. Be not greedy, not lustful, harmless, lest to those folk whom ye find scheming. Empowered be ye, strong minds, strong hearts, are come to those who study the craft. Awareness flows, all must play their part. Seek ye the mystery forever, wary of fullness, of growing daft. When I seem departed from this world, fret not. Seek me out in need and kind. Once in a month, when the moon is full, assemble in a deserted place. Open to me your body and mind. 
gather in forests in rooms of books join thee together to adore me the mother goddess queen of witches aid will come to those who speak my name who seek magic mystery revealed in this way be your chains unbinded be free in mind and heart teach on the truth be open-minded bide the witch's law in perfect love perfect trust by light of moon and sun so shall thine will therefore come to pass the witch's right be done blessed be so you can see from this this is what i really tried here i tried to really capture the feeling and the content of charles godfrey leland's original charge with the goddess um i just also wanted to make it well less terrible um in every way but also <laughs> I, I wanted to remove the parts that were very hateful and replace them with things that um you know are still true so like do not be like others who only follow who grovel who hope only dreaming be as people who are empowered okay and then you know I go on to say the same thing like don't worry when I'm not here if you feel like the goddess has deserted you you feel like you're alone in this universe seek me out in need once a month assemble and you'll see me in the moon you'll feel me in her light um, you know and and I will come to all those who seek the magic right that's how everyone feels about deity something that you have to seek and then you'll find it um, and then I, I use some of the traditional witch, Wiccan wording here at the very end and I purposefully chose um, a very odd structured rhyming pattern and the syllables all line up and everything so it really captures the poetry of that time period but it is slightly more modernized and if you'd like to use this as your charge when you draw down the moon that's more than you're more than welcome I do a different kind of moon ritual every time I never do the same thing every time but if I was going to do one thing every time it would be something like this charge probably because it covers covers everything it's, it's all there you know so maybe I'll go about memorizing it myself but we'll see so there's one thing I wanted to talk about um, you know this we're getting close to the end of the topics here this is probably gonna be an hour and a half video which we've come to expect since I messed up the um, and I'll actually upload a corrected um, uh, so what's the word syllabus to the first couple videos so it's clear what, what's going on here but we're basically doing this whole nine lecture series and seven lectures now so this is the second to last lecture um, I wanted to talk about aspecting versus invocation so I mentioned that aspecting is a form of binding and it really is right so aspecting is different than invoking the energy it's where you're bringing the energy down into the air around you and you're communing with it you're allowing it to affect your mannerisms and your divine persona but it's more of a mask it's more like you're being yourself but everything that comes out of yourself is in the form of a divine being so people have the ability to interact with a divine being um, but you're still in control of your actions um, and um, usually the idea is that your energy becomes more inspirational to other people and it indirectly affects people um, indirectly affects you it just basically allows you to kind of act play the part of the divine being so that other people can find inspiration in and transformation in that energy but you're always in total control when you do it if you invoke the energy then that is really for personal transformation unless you invoke enough of it if you invoke a lot of energy you basically will become the goddess your awareness will transcend and become one with hers or, or his if you're working with the god or you're working with a genderless deity it's all the same um, but you'll basically kind of become hypnotized by it and you can lose control and sometimes you know people will be really affected they'll be really different um, so we're talking about the difference between like um, talking and and speaking like Caridwen and um, and being able to provide some of her wisdom to people versus um, like being able to walk on coals and <laughs> and drink insanely more alcohol than you could normally because you're aspecting a drink or a, a deity that drinks or something um we're talking about um people who are not able to stop themselves from speaking or speaking in tongues or um, telling other people like uh, premonitions about the future um usually the difference in behavior is um is very slight sometimes it's very extreme it just depends on how much of the divine energy is invoked 
Um, and it's usually permanent in the sense that somebody who invokes divinity is going to be permanently more divine. Um, the, the, the bigger actions, the, the speaking as if they were the goddess will fade once the ritual is done. Um, but they'll always have, they'll, they'll stand up straighter and they'll push their, um, head up more and they'll have better posture just overnight, something like that, just because of the energy. Uh, yeah, and it gives them a greater awareness at all times and, and increased abilities um, for like premonitions and divination. and But it could be other things. It could be um, greater ability like physically and at some physical task or mentally that people could come out of it even being smarter or better at reasoning. I mean, we're talking about energy that transcends matter and reality and time. So... When you bring enough of that in, it, I mean, it could literally make you lose your mind. <laughs> so um, there is some amount of care that has to be taken by people who are invoking divine energy in, in large amounts, like drawing down the moon can be a little dangerous. It's um, the most mild form, really, of this kind of thing. But as long as you're working with deity and your intention in the ritual is positive, that's the purpose for stating the intent to be very clear. This is my intent. As long as those are the case, you stand very little chance of actually being hurt or hurting anyone around you, contrary to what Hollywood wants you to think. Ritual is not that dangerous and deity is mostly good. <laughs> um, but, you know, obviously things can always get out of control if people aren't careful. So be careful. <laughs> Listen to your body. You know, if you're hungry or something like that, don't pass out or have a medical issue and ritual because you weren't paying attention to your needs. Finally, I want to just very quickly touch on rituals with no deity. So technically anything can be a ritual. Um, your daily morning routine is how you get ready for work. And if you wake up 10 minutes late and you don't have enough time to, you know, brush your teeth in the shower or stare at the ceiling for three minutes before moving or drink your coffee, you know, upside down in a yoga position or whatever your daily ritual is, you don't have time to do your thing, then you're going to be off the whole day. Well, you'll just be off. You won't be yourself. You'll be tired. And, and you know, you have the same thing with like traditional holiday activities. Like you don't get to sit down with your glass of mulled wine and watch the Christmas movie, like a Christmas carol or whatever your Christmas movie is, then you don't even feel like it's Christmas. It may as well not even be Christmas, right? So everyone has like a way of doing things. Um, and these are really technically rituals and they're there to help us be successful in our lives and to help us be happy and to help us achieve our goals. And that's the same with all rituals. So ritual doesn't have to be something that is about deity at all. Um, you know, spell work is always a part of ritual, but really the whole ritual, um, energy is always invoked in ritual. The purpose of ritual is always going to be transformation of self or of the group, but it could be like to bring people together or to make groups more cohesive. Um, you know, so like, if every time you guys get together, you do some kind of icebreaker, like that's a ritual that helps you get to know each other and make the group more cohesive. So that's still technically a ritual, you know, and that's the cool thing about it, uh, about ritual. But if you wanted to do something like a formal ritual that didn't have anything to do with deity, maybe you would invoke deity broadly, just being like, we ask that divinity bless us on this day. And, and you don't say anything to any specific deity. You don't even break it up into the Lord and Lady. You just... State broadly divinity and you let people fill in the blanks for themselves. You know, that's a way to include more faiths. Um, obviously, it doesn't really include people that don't believe in divinity, but, you know, <laughs> you got to make you got to make compromises based on what your audience is and the ritual and what the purpose of the ritual is. Maybe it's not important to evoke deity at all. Maybe don't. Maybe in your head you invite deity to attend, but you don't say anything because it doesn't matter if other people bring deity in or not. Um, or maybe you just say, at this time, I will give everyone a moment of silence to invoke their deity into the sacred space, something like that. Um, you could remove the great rite, obviously. That's the most Wiccan and 
uh, religious part of the whole ritual, you could remove that and replace it with a portion where after you generate the energy you need, everyone falls down from exertion and they're all just laying on the ground. Or maybe everyone stands holding hands in silence and, you know, sways back and forth and just feels the effects of the energy that they generated. You know, whatever you want to do to simulate the fact that you had a ritual climax and now you're coming back down is fine. A ritual needs a climax. It needs energy to back up the purpose of it or it's not a ritual. Um, but whatever that climax is and however you didn't differentiate the climax from the coming down portion is really not that important. Um, you know, if you're trying to be a Wiccan high priestess, you should learn and master doing the great rite. But part of being um, Wiccan even is being able to create rituals that are more public or more open to different faiths as well at least within the open-minded path. So if you're my student, I'll expect you to be able to do rituals with no deity in addition to doing rituals with deity, regardless of what you personally believe in, because I am going to challenge you. <laughs> um, but if you're just solitary, then you can decide for yourself how you want to do things, and that's pretty much totally fine. Or if you wind up joining a coven one day, you'll see that they do things specific ways, and that's fine too. All right, so that is... Uh, lecture six on divinity and um, the divine archetypes and we talked about uh, why you incorporate divinity in ritual and how you would do a ritual without divinity and how to construct a ritual. The homework this time is a lot of reading. Um, we're finishing a lot of books basically. There's a couple, only a couple chapters of natural magic that I didn't have you guys read. I just don't think they're that important. Um, you can feel free to finish them as well. The chapter on like card magic and weather magic. It's all like if you don't do tarot with uh, a regular deck of cards, then you probably don't care about card magic. But So it's up to you if you want to just finish the whole book just to say you read it or not. But I'd say read chapter 12 this week, definitely. Um, in Witchcraft Today, a lot of people really didn't like it, <laughs> so I'm sorry. I really think you should read chapter 13. Um, it's called Recapitulation, and it's where Gardner kind of puts everything together, and it really does form the backbone of a lot of modern Wicca. So I, I do think you should read it, even though Gerald Gardner is generally terrible for most people. A lot of people don't like Scott Cunningham either, but he has a lot to say that applies here. And I just really think that Scott Cunningham is very good at giving you the information in such a way that you can decide for yourself what you want to believe. So I do recommend... Um, I had some issues with his with what I recommended people read in the past. It just it turns out that I had to go back and redo a couple of the homework. So I'll repost those to the website. People who are new coming into this, I will put the corrections for the homeworks in the YouTube videos um, and everything, so that new people coming into this will uh, have have the correct assignments at the right times. But um, to make up for some of that, there is a lot of Scott Cunningham to be read in this um, lecture. But I would read chapters 4 through 6, 8 through 10, 14, 16 through 17 of Living Wicca. That's probably like 50 pages. Um, some of these chapters are like three pages. They're really short. Uh, in Wicca, I'd read chapter 6 through 9. Um, again, like chapter 9 is like literally a page and a half. <laughs> and then chapter 13. Um, and then I'd read the following passages in the Gardnerian Book of Shadows, Drawing Down the Moon, The Charge, Cakes and Wine, The Meeting Dance, and The Witch's Chant or Rune. Um, these are really quick, easy things to get through. They just kind of add some perspective about what the Gardnerian line looks like. A lot of people like to compare their own practice to the Gardnerian line because a lot of people view Gardnerian Wicca as like the standard of Wicca witchcraft because it's the original form of it. But Obviously, I'm putting quotes around all of those things because none of them are really true. <laughs> so, um, but if you're interested in Gardnerian witchcraft, I definitely would take a look at those things. I personally love Gardnerian witchcraft. I just don't think that it's the standard. <laughs> um, so uh, then as the homework assignment itself, um, you should collect, select an upcoming Sabbath or Esbat. So we have... Um, the full moon just happened, so there's a new moon coming that you could do a ritual for. Um, there is the Samhain is coming up, or you could just do a ritual to a specific deity just because you like them. You could do a ritual because you want to use a specific kind of deity's energy in your daily life, or to do a certain kind of magic. It can be on any day, so like if you're trying to do a ritual using Mercury's energy, say you're trying to improve your communication with someone at work. And it's nothing you've done has worked. So now you're going to invoke Mercury's energy and then use that to help you become a better communicator. Um, you'd want to do that on any Monday 
literally Monday is Mercury's day. So any Monday is fine. <laughs> um, then you would um, basically write your ritual as we've discussed, you know, define the intent and purpose, decide if you're going to do spell work or not, just build a ritual based on that framework, you know, like there's, I literally turn them into check boxes because you should be able to basically check those things all off the list. Um, and as long as you're checking all those things off the list in generally that order, then the ritual is going to be successful. Um, once you've designed the ritual, um, you can send it to me if you want to make sure that it makes sense or if, I, if you want to get any feedback on it. Um, if you're my student, you have to send it to me to get credit for this. Um, if I give you feedback in the ritual, then you can take that in and make any changes and provide me a final draft. But I feel like by this time, most people will nail the ritual in the first time. That's not to add stress to things, but I just feel like ritual is a really personal thing. So it's kind of like it's like writing a personal diary entry, you know, it's like personal, so it's hard to get it wrong. <laughs> so, um, and then you're going to have to do the ritual. Um, you should write it in your book of shadows or book of mirrors, whatever you keep, or grimoire, whatever you keep, you should write it down. You should, um, do the ritual and then write down how you feel, any feelings you had during ritual, feelings you have after ritual, everything that about that. Um, if it's made some change in your life, you should write what that is. If you have criticism for yourself, things that you should do differently next time, you should put that. Um, that's just all stuff you should get in the habit of recording somewhere. So, um, And you can bring a book into Circle with you. It's better if it's handwritten usually. So if you're doing some of these more complicated rituals where you're like reading ancient Egyptian, like no one expects you to memorize that. <laughs> you bring your Book of Shadows in a ritual with you, of course. So yeah, I think that covers um, invocation. Feel free to leave a comment on this video or to email us at covenantofopenmind at gmail.com. Um, I'll get this uploaded and I'll figure out what's wrong with the website and get the assignments all fixed and uploaded. And uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Blessed be.